You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello. Why do <laughs> I get such such a big build up this time? I don't know. I'm not often. Because you're worth we're it. We're physically in the same place, aren't we? Television is Daniel Freib. Uh, Lionel, where are we? We're in King's Cross in London. Central we were London. at Vermute- Vermuteria, um, our new hangout. D- Daniel, did you try the vermouth? I did. We got a free sample. Um, I'm still n- I'm not... 100% sold on it um, it's a bit sweet for me I don't really like sweet things uh, you're, you're, in, you're in London though Daniel I understand yes. you had an interesting coffee experience yesterday oh um, <laughs> that, would, that would take a whole podcast to tell that story <laughs> I was absolutely fleeced um, but what about the order what did you order oh um, a, a cappuccino and a, a cardamom bun or uh, a, a cap and a cardi b as the beard stroking <laughs> herbert behind the till <laughs> i called it oh dear <laughs> sorry i'm not going i didn't reveal where it was so that's i'm allowed Somewhere to be rude and offensive how anyway. was your cap and cardi b it was fine it was pre regulation i never had a cardamom bun before but it was fine yeah no. how many english pounds was it Lots. Mm. Yeah. That's one of the problems with London, isn't it? But, yeah. You know, you're, you're yeah. used to Italy where it's a euro for a coffee. Um, well, to be honest, I was just relieved to have anything that wasn't French coffee. I mean, it was very, I was very grateful to ASO um, for having a final day that at least, it was, it was a sort of final day coffee stop in Switzerland. And they took pity on everyone who had been on the Dauphiné for a week. And they took us to Switzerland for the afternoon to get some decent coffee and some Rivella. Oh, my favourite, no, my no. soft drink of choice. No, <laughs> this is kind of, uh, this is European iron brew as far as I'm concerned, this stuff. It's What's wrong with iron brew? There are, wow. a lot, there are a lot of people on the Dauphiné not happy to go into Switzerland. Um, Switzerland is a country that ironically, for a country infamous for its, um, for its inveterate neutrality, it's a country that really divides opinion. You don't like it much, do you? I, I think it's beautiful and it's it's very clean. It, it just feels like every time you're there, you're just you're just there to open your wallet and pay more for things than really you and, should. And you need different plugs and you need a, a thing for your windscreen on the road and there's D- different data hassles. roaming rates. Oh yeah, yeah all that. It's a great flag though. It's a faff, isn't it? It's, it's a faff, log. Switzerland. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a good advert for the eu but maybe we shouldn't go there well um mm, yeah do you not remember the year the tour had its rest day in Bern, and yeah. we spent about a week's worth of budget on two nights well, that's two, the problem th- that year there were rest days in andorra and uh, and burn yeah Bo- you know burn is beautiful it was it was a beautiful yeah. place to be for the day but anyway you are at the dauphine oh, um, daniel lots to report on from yes. this is our first podcast since the giro isn't it our first regular podcast and what two more after this before we'll be in Brussels for the Tour de France yeah if you didn't if you missed it last week we were covering the women's tour the Oval Energy women's tour with daily podcasts from there and we've still got a, a little mini special to come from there as well from Orla Shinoui's date in the Canyon Shram team car can I ask an ignorant question mm. Um, Ovo has got nothing to do with that I think this is a, there's a Swiss link here because Ovaltine is Swiss isn't it was um Ovo has got nothing to do with Ovaltine has it it's an energy no. company it's Daniel, an energy okay, company that's what I need Ovo. to know not oval team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have thought you'd mm. be really anti oval team. Kind of a race. Yeah, I'm Goes not well with a I'm not big bun, I would think. <laughs> anyway, um, Lionel, have you got a news roundup? There's been a bit of racing. There had, well, there's been a lot of news, hasn't there? Um, yes. Team Ineos have had an absolute shocker of a week or so, yeah, haven't a they? season. Um, in spite of winning two stages at the Dauphiné. Yes. Well, yeah, but d- overshadowed completely by a terrible crash for Chris Froome in his uh, recon ride for the time trial at the Dauphiné and Roanne. Daniel, you were there. Um, you can fill us in on what's happened there, but the headlines are that he crashed very heavily um, while going downhill on his time trial bike, took his hands off the handlebars to kind of blow his clear his nose and ended up in hospital with a fractured femur, broken hip, fractured ribs and a fracture in his neck and likely to be out for perhaps six months before he's back um, on the bike or back in competition. We're not 
too sure how long his recovery will take but what we do know is definitely out of the Tour de France so there will be no fifth Tour de France victory for Chris Froome this summer quick one on that just I will maybe return to this but um, when I speak about this incident to Tim Harris who is the oracle on all things cycling uh, at the women's tour he said ban time trial bikes wow Th- they're unstable they're unsafe um the, I mean, the, the, the this this <laughs> illustrates it. They are, they yeah, are them. yeah. Ban yeah. time trial bikes. Get them on normal road bikes for time trials. Then everyone's equal. Bike industry wouldn't like it, but that that was his solution. I'm just quoting. A radical Don't shoot the solution. Messenger. Um, and things got worse uh, in a way because the defending Tour de France champion Geraint Thomas then had a crash at the Tour of Switzerland yesterday and has pulled out of the race but we understand he has the all clear for the Tour de France still got two weeks to recover Um, we gather suffering the effects of concussion today Uh, they'll obviously monitor him but we don't think that his position in the Tour de France is in any doubt but uh, really difficult week or so for Team Ineos and we'll talk all about that in the first part of the podcast and, and recap what actually happened at the Dauphiné as well which was won by the Danish rider Jakob Fulsang who also won the race two years ago another big stage race win for Astana they really are having a fantastic season uh, and a, a kind of a, an interesting race we'll talk to Daniel about that because it didn't start in traditional Dauphiné territory it started didn't end in traditional Dauphiné territory it just skirted with traditional Dauphiné territory Daniel can uh, fill us in on that uh, when we talk about the Dauphiné in part one but the highlights of the week really were uh, other than Fuglsang's win ahead of Van Garderen and Emmanuel Buchmann overall were the two stage victories for Wout van Aert uh, in the time trial, perhaps not so surprisingly. Um, well, the margin was surprising. The margin, the margin was, was astonishing. Yeah. Beat Van Garderen and Tom de Moulin um, by, well, Van Garderen, I think, by 31 seconds and de Moulin by 47 seconds. He then followed that up, Van Aert, with a, a, a stage victory, a road stage victory in a, a sprint finish the following day. There were also stage wins for Julian Alaphilippe, Sam Bennett, the Irish sprinter who keeps delivering victories for Bora Hansgrohe but won't be going to the Tour de France. Edvald Bosenhagen, Dylan Turns, Wout Poles and Dylan Van Bala um, were the other stage winners. Adam Yates led the race but then fell ill over the final weekend and pulled out on the final day. Uh, so no overall result for him. Um, so yeah an event for Dauphiné this year the Tour de Suisse is underway as well that's still got a few days to run but so far Rowan Dennis has won the opening time trial and there have been stage wins for Luis Leon Sanchez and Elia Viviani and Peter Sagan only his third victory of the season Uh, quite surprising really when you consider uh, how prolific he is normally but perhaps signs of some form as he bids to go for yet another green jersey at the Tour he had an absolutely brilliant lead out from Jasper Stuyven for that of Trek Segafredo. Did you see uh, Trek Segafredo's social media post afterwards um, talking about the conversation, um, suggesting it was a friendly conversation between John Degenkolb and Jasper Stoven, just comparing notes about how the lead out had gone. I, I would suggest that it wasn't too <laughs> it was, cordial. It was genuinely one of the best lead outs I've ever seen. <laughs> Unfortun- yeah, they're unfortunately not teammates, of course. So. Um, the Belgium tour was also on, um, and that was won by... A teenager Remco Evenepoel he also won a stage and there were victories for Tim Wellens in the time trial and Victor Kampenertz as well but a a real breakthrough victory for Evenepoel who has had a lot of hype in his first year as a professional for De Koenig Quickstep and well winning the the Belgium tour the tour of Belgium that is a significant victory for him Uh, Chris Nylands of Israel Cycling Academy won the tour of Hungary and then there was also the Mont Ventoux Denivelle Challenge Race which you're you're holding your nose uh, you think this is a stinker of a race no we had uh, we were chatting about this beforehand maybe we'll return to it over a glass of vermouth we were discussing this I I think it's a a very flawed concept well I thought it was a dreadful race I thought it looked great I love Mont Ventoux and the surprise opportunity to see a race on Mont Ventoux, a one-day race on Mont Ventoux, that, it was interesting. The field wasn't great, but the, the duel between Roman Bardet and Jesus Harada was interesting, no? And, uh, I mean, Bardet was coming out of the Dauphiné where he'd finished, uh, he'd finished 10th overall, not a brilliant week for him. And uh, Harada, who's won two stages in the overall at the Tour of Luxembourg and had a bit of a, a few days off, um, really did a number on him. I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh. Oh. 
the should finish at the bottom. The computer is my opinion. says no. They should what before they climb it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a crit round Carpentras. Is that your idea for a one day race? Is it? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, no. I, it would be. It could be good, but um, yeah, I would. Would should they should include the descent down to where would they finish? Vaison La Romaine. So go over the top and, yeah. and round into the... Yeah, and, we, and there have been good stages of... Uh, Tour de France stages that have finished where well, they've gone over the Ventoux. Um, Eros Poli is m- probably the most famous mm. um, Tour de France stage ever featuring the Ventoux in 1994. Finished in Carpentras, didn't it? Mm. Won by Eros Poli after a, uh, an epic breakaway. Um, something like that would, be, would make more sense. I just didn't... Uh, you know, I don't know how many teams were in the field, but I, c- I could identify about five climbers in the whole field of over 150 riders, which, you know, re- is a reflection on how stretched the rosters are. And I just thought that that was a bit of a shame. But this is a different issue. It, saying it was not a great field and saying it's not a great race are two issues. I'd agree with you on the field, but I think... The st- well, it wasn't a great race this year. It wasn't a great race. No, but it was... An, it was, an, it was, it was it's a one-day nice. race that finishes... Nice. nice for a snooze. Yeah, it's a one-day race that finishes... On top of a mountain, ever going to be a good, ever going to be a tactically interesting race? I would suggest not. So well, it's like a time trial. You were saying, Daniel, the the old classic dead out one day race, which was not as hard as riding Mont Ventoux. It was kind of medium, almost like a medium mountain stage of the Tour de France back in the day, wasn't it? Um, and perhaps also coming a day after the Dauphiné, not the ideal slot. Maybe as a, a warm up for the Dauphiné, it would would be better. But maybe I'm biased because you know I went and rode Mont Ventoux three years ago, made a friends. Of the podcast special which is on the free podcast feed um, for a limited time only if you want to hear um, that uh, be quick because I think it'll be taken back yeah, down again you want to hear some heavy weekend, breathing uh, heavy breathing there's swear words in it as well <laughs> I forgot about that I had to put the, the, the language advisory notice on the old uh, on the old podcast for that one um, but that's available for people to listen to if they want one other small bit of news from the other week was that there was the Hammer Series the latest of the Hammer Series races in Limburg in the Netherlands that was won by De Koenig Quickstep and next year in February there will be a Hammer Series event for men and the first women's event uh, held in Colombia so that's something to look forward to Could that, maybe that would be my debut at a Hammer Series race I quite fancy a trip to Colombia in February London to Brighton semi-classic does that not feature in your news roundup we all rode the, well Daniel didn't ride the London to Brighton but Richard you and I rode with Simon the photographer and uh, Jonathan Rowe Adam Bowie Paul Scoynes David Luxton various members of the cycling podcast team Rose Manley as well Tom Carey as well, our colleague from the Telegraph, um, and yeah, it was a great day, despite Fantastic, yeah. terrible weather, wasn't it? Terrible weather, but it was nice to arrive in Brighton on the beach, and so far we've raised £1,400 for the British Heart Foundation, which is the charity that runs the London to Brighton ride, and if you would like to uh, top that up, um, well, why not? It's a, great, um, it's a great charity, and we are grateful to their support in terms of sponsoring the podcast for a few episodes in the last few weeks you can go to justgiving.com slash the hyphen cycling hyphen podcast and uh, well you can donate as little as two pounds and if everyone who had a heart donated two pounds then well we'd have quite a lot of money wouldn't we just very lastly another thing you need to tell the listeners about if you're going to be in brussels for the grand depart of the tour de france We'll be there too, and we are hosting a little event at the Brussels Beer Project on Friday, July the 5th from 7.30 till 9pm. And if you would like to come along to that, uh, tickets are available on a first-come, first-served basis. Go to beercity.brussels events and you can uh, find out how to get a ticket. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. I like uh, the bib shirt of uh, Rafa because they're really comfortable. My name is Alberto Bettiol and I race for uh, Team EF Education First. Yesterday I also tested him in the cobbles and they are pretty good. No, I have uh, any issue about it. So I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to keep on riding with, with, uh, with the Shemi of Rafa and uh, I recommend you all of you guys uh, all in this beep shirt. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for our, being our headline sponsor at the Cycling Podcast. Um, we are 
very appreciative of their support. And Lionel and I were very honoured last night to host an event uh, organised by Simon Mottram of Rafa raising money for Ambitious About Autism. Uh, that was good fun. I must also mention the latest EF Gone Racing film uh, by made by Rafa. You'll find it on their YouTube channel. And it covers uh, Lachlan Morton, Alex Howes and Taylor Finney's uh, efforts at Dirty Kanza recently. Um, this is the first of their kind of alternative calendar outings and I have it's to like, say it's like Pyro Bay from Millennials isn't it <laughs> <laughs> 26 minutes long I think it is the film so it's the longest one and it's really good I, I recommend I watched it this morning and um, I didn't know much about Dirty Cans it looked fantastic it looked great fun actually um, and so yeah have a have a look at that it's really worth watching well Daniel you're just back from the Dauphiné and it was a dramatic race not a great no race it was a poor race it was a poor race a um, poor from race, a spectacle but, point of view but lots of drama not least chris Froome. yeah the the route wasn't particularly set up for a dramatic finale we didn't get a dramatic finale the the final stage was um well it was a mountain stage but more of a medium mountain stage the climbs were um, not particularly steep there was a tailwind on um, the final part of the stage so yeah we expected a big uh, grand finale something similar to the Dauphiné two years ago that Jakob Fulsang won um sort of snatched from Richie Port where Port was put under pressure um, almost from kilometer zero on the final day we've seen that a few times in the Dauphiné the last few years there have been some absolute humdingers of final stages but this one alas was a bit of a damp squib uh, the weather was pretty terrible for a good half of the race wasn't it cold and wet um, and riders were they suffering from the effects I mean Adam Yates kind of fell ill was that weather related do we know I think so Napalm I think probably um, the weather conditions were pretty biblically bad on the Saturday uh, hailstorms and um, we thought one stage that stage wasn't going to finish it did but yeah a few guys suffered you know, Stephen Kreiswijk suffered as well on the last day um, fell ill Yates as well the kind of illnesses we think they'll they'll probably be able to get over in, in the space of two or three days shouldn't at this stage three weeks out from Tour de France affect their preparations too much I wouldn't have thought Froome though Froome I mean you messaged us Daniel uh, just that, that was where I heard the, about his crash. Can you just tell us, Ram, because they're obviously war, uh, warming up for the time trial, doing their um, reconnaissance when the, the accident happened. I mean, how? where were you? How did you hear about it? How did word filter back? Well, I was moonlighting in my other role. Um, so I was working for ITV and uh, the Dauphiné. And what usually happens on a time trial day is, well, we have a, a highlights program from the Dauphiné. So in the morning, we'll typically go out onto the course to film some of the recades, which the footage will then be used for some voiceover. Gary Imlach back in the studio in London will then say, you know, Chris Froome, here's Chris Froome this morning going out on his recce. And so that's what we did. We had word from Ineos the previous day that they were going to go out about 12 o'clock. We positioned ourselves from three or four... Um, so the cameraman and I, we positioned ourselves three or four kilometres down the route um, before Ineos were due to get there. So we saw pretty much the whole field come through um, on their recce's. Then we saw Wout Pals and Chris Froome. The footage has kind of gone viral because there, there, were, there are not many journalists at the Dauphin. There are not many TV crews. We were, I think, the only people who filmed the recce. And there was a, a kind of a curious and, as it turned out, sort of serendipitous or... Um, ominous conversation between Wout Pals and Chris Froome that we overheard and was caught on the camera and Wout Pals telling Chris Froome not to take any risks but he was sort of joking as Froome was putting on a, a long sleeve jersey and um, yeah so then they disappeared and the, there was a climb on the route so they were going to do this climb and, and, and then descend back into Roanne in the meantime we'd gone back to Roanne the teams are all set up outside the press room pretty much we have to send our footage then um, which we did takes a while probably took us half an hour or so we went back out to the bus expecting chris Froome to to be back and to be finishing his recce and we've been told that he would speak to us afterwards um anyway we waited longer than we expected to wait and um a, a certain point the the Ineos press officer George came over and said Chris won't be speaking when he comes back 
and we sort of laughed and said, well, what have we done? Surely we kind of upset him in the time between us filming him on the recce and, you know, now. And, and um, George didn't really know what to respond to that, I don't think. Anyway, he, he then went off. We, we saw with hindsight um, what was, you know, scenes of consternation um, around the bus. We didn't know what was going on. But then Dave Brailsford came over and said, look, Froome has crashed. Um, it's bad. He's going to be out of the Tour de France. And, um, and yeah, and that was the, the bombshell dropping. Um, at that point, when you, you know, you're working for uh, television, you've got a lot of, sort of decisions to make. Do you go to the hospital? Um, is Froome, was Froome at the hospital? It turned out he wasn't at the hospital. We didn't know that at that stage. Um, and we were also told that there'd be more comment from Ineos uh, in due course so we decided uh, um, having spoken to our director that the best thing to do would be to stay at the team bus and not to go off to uh, the hospital in Rouen we thought actually he might be airlifted to Saint Etienne we thought he might go to Lyon so um, that was also difficult it's also difficult to get back out onto the course that the course was a kind of loop and it would have mean ha- it would have meant having to cross the course a couple of times so there are all sorts of things that just made it seem risky to kind of pursue the story in that way so we stayed at the bus Dave Brailsford spoke to us at about half three and it was only after that that we found out that Froome was still at the point at the spot where he'd crashed and then we started hearing from a few people who had seen it Dan Martin had seen it um, Seb Piquet our friend um, the voice of race radio at the Tour de France he's also race radio at the Dauphiné he had seen Froome shortly after he'd crashed or he'd seen the, the scene developing with ambulances and so forth um, and it, so, sorry Daniel he was at the scene for a couple of hours but yes with, with uh, medics who yes as far as, yeah, I think two hours was what was mentioned afterwards by most people. I think Lakeep reported about two hours. Um, certainly a substantial amount of time. And, and as I say, that came as a surprise to, to pretty much everyone. Everyone who was back in Rowan reporting the story was, well, had assumed or was under the impression that by that time he he was long gone and um, the tv crew from danish television tv2 had gone to rowan to the hospital they got pretty much nothing um, i think finally they did see a, an ineos team car um because Froome was there for a short time in rowan but yeah it's you know i mean when at the hospital you mean yeah at, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah at the hospital um and then i'm not sure exactly at what time he was airlifted away but um, we had sort of covered the story to a large extent by that point, and the order we got was to then refocus on the on the time trial itself, because by this point it was sort of half three, four in the afternoon, and the leaders were going out, coming back in. And, you know, it was also very clear from what we were hearing about the crash that it wasn't a routine collarbone break whereby Froome might have been in a position to give us an interview later that day from his hospital bed. It was much more serious than that. So we had to kind of leave the story alone. There's also part of you that doesn't want to be... I mean, obviously you defer to your director, but you, you don't want to be sort of voyeuristic and, and, and kind of mawkish about the, the thing, going to the hospital and sort of, you know, wandering into into hospital wards uninvited. Although sometimes, you know, certain directors, I think, will probably ask that of you. I mean, it, it, it is a freakish accident in, in lots of respects. The fact that it happened on, on the recce and um, that it was, you know, taking his, his, his hands off the bars and being blown into this wall. Was it, was it a very blustery day? Was it a windy day? It, it was quite windy. I mean, we definitely remarked on it. The cameraman, um, my cameraman and I, in the morning when we were um, out on the course um, watching the, the guys go past on recce's, um, difficult to know when you're not on a bike and you're not on a time trial bike with a disc wheel but yeah it was it was pretty blustery it wasn't fine weather i mean i think if you watch the time trial later that day it looked as though it the weather was set fairly fair that hadn't been the case um in the morning and as i understand it um certainly where the crash happened it was i wouldn't say it was a built-up area but there were you know houses either side of the road detached houses with sort of you know gardens in between them so i think there were there were so sort of wind tunnels there were kind of wind yeah. tunnels and as i understand it that's that it was at a point like that where he did feel well he was kind of buffeted by the wind um but the, you know the other thing is people wondered why it hadn't been filmed, it hadn't been seen by members of the public. Um, the Dauphiné, I mean, if you go back and watch footage of any stage of the Dauphiné 
last week, you realise how few people actually attend the Dauphiné. I mean, it's it, it goes to well, most days it starts and finishes in tiny villages. Rouen's a reasonable sized town, but um, this was a village five or six kilometres outside Rouen. Um, I don't know if there was anyone at the roadside at that the point where he did crash but it's quite conceivable that it was only a small handful of people who were even who could even conceivably have witnessed it and Dan Martin obviously was following wasn't he and he gave uh, well he he'd spoke about it a day or so later he'd obviously been quite shaken up by it because it, it looked um, shocking to him but the, the severity of the injuries I think took everybody by surprise you know I mean Our, the, hours in surgery to stabilise those brakes as well yeah so a long, a long road back for a rider who's um, just turned 34. Yeah, and well, I mean, we, we're, we'd be speculating about you know how he, that recovery will go, but you're right, it is a long road back, and and it completely changes um, Team Ineos's plans for the Tour de France at fairly short notice. I mean. Uh, Richard, they've already had um, the situation earlier in the season with Egan Bernal, who was supposed to go to the Giro as Ineos's team leader, and then he had a crash. Allegedly, in according to Richard. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. He did, um, he, he did. Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to put on the record that any uh, speculation on my part in, a, in an earlier podcast was uninformed and incorrect speculation. I'd just like to put that on the record. So he Bernard, will well, now I'm, be in I'm the tree. Well, Daniel's presented me with photographic evidence of uh, of Bernal's uh, scar following his uh, surgery on his collarbone. So I'm happy to accept that. Well, Bernal will be at the Tour de France, of course. And but the only re- I mean, the reason why I suggested that Bernal's crash might not have happened was because back in uh, March, I, I spoke to somebody at Team Sky, as it was then, and they spoke about... Um, really quite advanced plans to remove Bernal from the Giro and put him in the tour team and was the person you spoke to Egan Bernal <laughs> <laughs> no um, uh, and the reason for that and, and, the, and the reason why um, you know I thought that there might have been some effort to not appear to take Bernal out of the, the Giro team um, by choice is because there was quite a lot of pressure on Team Sky to put a uh, you know, having won the Giro the previous year to put up a good defence of it this year so to have either Geraint Thomas or Bernal in the race Thomas didn't want to go and um, Pinarello as well their bike sponsor maybe influential in this they're a sponsor of the Giro and their Italian company uh, but Thomas obviously wanted to go back to the Tour Defence title and Bernal was you know um, leading the, the team at the Giro and it just it, it all seemed quite convenient but I'm, I'm sure that he did crash and break his collarbone I have no reason to, to doubt that at all Chute, chute à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Seb PK, race radio at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode is sponsored by Harry's Razors. The Tour de France is looming, Richard. Three weeks on the road. Have you got enough stocks of Harry's Razors to take with you? Well, as you know, Lionel, I subscribe now to Harry's Razors. I get a fresh, fresh razor blades um, every couple of months they know exactly how many i need they know how often i shave because i told them and uh, they arrive in the post very handy that is too one of the things that you often forget when you're in the supermarket so that's handy um but harry's are offering a special trial set to listeners of the cycling podcast uh, for three pounds 95 all you have to do is go to harrys.com forward slash cycling and in that trial set you will get uh, everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. A weighted ergonomic handle, five precision engineered blades with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel and travel blade cover. And, uh, well, I can heartily endorse the Harry's razor, which I've been using now for about two years and lo- looking good, am I, Lionel? Absolutely. I mean, it's... it's Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <no. laughs> uh, get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your trial set for £3.95. Support the Cycling Podcast and get your trial set delivered to you, including the razor handle, the five-blade cartridge, the foaming shave gel, and the travel blade cover for £3.95. Go to harrys.com forward slash cycling right now. That's harrys.com forward slash cycling. 
so what what do we know now we know that Bernal will be at the tour we know that Chris Froome won't we think that Geraint Thomas will recover um, we, we don't know what kind of impact this will have on his um, on his uh, preparations now I mean and he's so by, miss- a, by a series of total coincidences it may well transpire that what happens is that Bernal does lead Team mm. Ineos into the Tour de France well uh, what about Wout Paul so who won the most difficult stage of the Dauphiné in pretty impressive circumstances. I mean, he really, well, he he, he sprung a, a, a late move that left everyone standing, really, and that looked like a statement of intent almost. Would you put your money on Bernal or Poles? I don't know. I mean, Bernal clearly has, uh, you know, has a kind of the, the, the pedigree in the sense of, you know, just a kind of a... a real talent polls we kind of know a bit more about a bit more of a known quantity whereas Bernal we don't really know yet how he will how he will hold up under the pressure of leading a team and and trying to actually win the Tour de France I mean uh, the big difference between you know finishing in you know with the sort of you know, top 20, top 10, top 5, top 3 and actually winning the race I mean they are big big jumps aren't they and uh, as talented as Bernal obviously is, you know, can he can he can he do it? We just don't know yet. We don't really have enough evidence to go on. Whereas Paul, and and that's what's quite exciting about the prospect of Bernal. Thomas, it, we know we can use last year's race as a kind of benchmark, assuming that he's he's um, fit and healthy when the race starts. Poles, we kind of know that. You know, he he blows a bit hot and cold over three weeks, but that's because he's been in a team role, I guess. We've not really seen him as a as a leader. Beyond that team, though, um, what did we learn from the Dauphiné about other contenders, not least Fuglsang, the the revelation of the season? Well, Fuglsang was uh, imperious, really, from start to finish. Um, from the was it the second day when there was a bit of sort of unexpected general classification action um, in the Contal region and Fulsang took a time bonus um, he and, and was the best of the general classification riders um, he was never really in trouble and in fact looked, looked the strongest of the general classification riders looked the strongest of um, well in a field that that had some pretty stellar climbing talent in it. The the best climbers really we've seen this year, Thibaut Pino, Adam Yates. Um, he looked the strongest of all of them and, and really looked like a different rider, different animal from the full stand we've known um, over the past few years. He's been a good rider, a solid rider, but you know he's a guy who's done 12 Grand Tours in his career, has finished in the top 10 twice, won 7th place, won 10th place um, and he I mean some of those a lot of those Grand Tours have been in support of, of other riders but he's someone who struggled in Grand Tours um, and prior to this year he's also a rider that no one really would have picked out as a threat to win the Tour de France I now think he's he's in the top three or four riders most likely to win it very different um win at the Dauphiné this year I mean his win a couple of years ago was a real smash and grab affair and he benefited from the others ganging up on Richie Port this was very a very different type of win and you know he, he was as you say the strongest in the race and supported by a really really strong team who were watching them you know dominate the Dauphiné and then go you know, have a different team at Tour of Switzerland and ride very strongly there as well yeah, and I just uh, sense with him that, I mean, he's talked an awful lot about confidence and and there's no doubt that you know, Astana are having this stellar season, whatever the reasons are, um, they're having an incredible season, particularly in stage races. They're, the number of stage races they've won this year is quite staggering. But Fulsang seems like a rider who's uh, suddenly become very comfortable in his own skin. Um, he's already achieved more this season, well, enough to make this season an unqualified success. And um, even at the Dauphiné, you know, I, I asked him on the last morning, if he wasn't to win it, would it be a big drama? And he said, well, not really, because, you know, my season, in, in a certain sense, you could consider it complete already. Um, he'd already won the Dauphiné. So he was very cool and phlegmatic about that. But I kind of feel he's getting to that point about the even the tour and possibly everything else left in his career he's 34 years old and he just seems to me to to be sort of very serene and um and that kind of serenity is obviously enabling to get the best out of himself and he's also 
you know, backed up by this incredibly strong team of, of very aggressive riders, climbers. Um, I, you know, they're not a team that's going to ride the tour in the same way that an Ineos would ride the tour, um, a sort of Catanaccio style with, um, you know, six riders on the front setting a, a fast tempo, although that's what Astana did on the last stage. Astana style tends to be more aggressive they send guys down the road um they like they like to counter attack um so it'll be very it'll be a very different kind of race if all sang is to win it but um i think it's got a good chance i think there is a sense that it, sort of now or never for somebody like fool sang this season i mean you, you mentioned his results just to run through um the the stage race and one day results he's had so far this season second at strada bianca um third at the amstel gold race second at flesh will only one liege baston liege of course and then in the stage race he's third at tirreno adriatico fourth at tour of the basque country and now winning the dauphine that is a real collection of um of, of sort of results that kind of put you in mind a little bit of the the sort of the Bradley Wiggins, Chris Froome, Geraint Thomas exactly. sort the of momen- the momentum that's carried through blocks. from the yeah, that from go, the that spring go into the tour, and so you're right. And the tour is all about confidence and momentum, isn't it? And uh, well, we, it's a lot more perhaps defensive in a way than than the, the, Giro the guy. Can be, yep. so. The other guy, though, I think who falls into that category, and um, who we'd probably be talking about had he finished the race, is Adam Yates. Um, you know, he was on the brink of a second overall in the Dauphiné. He's had a similar. Maybe not quite as spectacular, but a strong, uh, you know, series of results all year, and he's carrying that into the tour as well. Yeah, and, and probably banished most doubts about his time trialing with a very strong ride in the time trial. You know, uh, there are only there's only one individual time trial in the Tour de France this year. It's not that long. It's 27 kilometers. There's a climb in it, as there was in the time trial at the Dauphiné. So, uh, I don't think it's going to have that much impact. Um, we're talking. You're talking one minute. Uh, a minute and a half from the best GC rider um, for probably for Adam Yates in that time trial. That's all he has to make up. And, you know, the, I think people have not really realised or acknowledged enough just how hard this year's Tour de France route is. I think it's one of the sort of gnarliest, most um, challenging for years. I, I mean, I, I was looking earlier today and I, I think there are 10 definite GC days where there is there's no doubt there'll be movement on general classification and there are probably four maybes on top of that um, you've got you've got the Cormé de Roseland, the Iseron, Val Turen, Galibier and Tourmalet which are all climbs where it's over an hour of climbing um, seven times to 2,000 metres in three days in the Alps so you know all that you add all that up and, and I think um, you know it's one for the climbers and um, it is you know, those difficulties uh, do give me some reservations about Fulsang and some of the other guys you might think are sort of borderline they've not really done it in the past because to me the winner of this Tour de France is someone who is a bit of an expert at um, negotiating not just a few pitfalls negotiating not just a few GC days but they're going to have to negotiate a lot of them and I think that is going to be a, a huge test of of someone's of a rider's ability to sort of construct that that three weeks um, which you know we've talked about before with Geraint Thomas and Richie Port guys like this who you know they've had a tendency to crash or they've had a tendency to have a bad day and you know full sang to be honest falls into that category whereas you've got the, the real experts like the Frooms, um, who's who've really made created a dynasty out of just bouncing bouncing off those you know those those issues and those problems. The cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for supporting the cycling podcast. Uh, you can get twenty five percent off all your Science and Sport products. You're going to sing the, you're going to chant the, the 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 code, the discount code, Lionel, like Orla and Rose did last week. No, in no, I'm not. But I did have a, a bar and a gel during the London to Brighton. On thought uh, you were going Sunday. well. Yeah, thought you were going yeah, well. I suddenly had a suddenly a had spurt. a real spurt. Yeah, mm. just on the approach to Ditchling Beacon. Um, I noticed that, but. But then Simon, the photographer, just pedalled away. I mean, he was good, wasn't he? He looked like Mikel Landa up there. Mm. Mm. Anyway, um, look back, did he? No. Um, So, Science and Sport, twenty five percent off at scienceandsport.com. What's the code? S I S C P twenty five. When I say it, I hear the chant in my head. S I S C P twenty five. Scienceandsport.com. 
Daniel, you didn't catch any of the women's tour coverage, did you? There was a, a very um, spectacular effort by Orla one day in her story of the stage to... She, she included everyday local literary or um, mm. song references mm. uh, in her story of the stage. One day, uh, the, the day that we went all the way around Coventry, mm. um, she managed to combine the two sort of local literary heavyweights, Philip Larkin and Daniel Freeb. Oh, really? I don't know if you caught that. Did you go around Coventry? It went all the way around Coventry, right. yeah. And uh, it was really No, I did. Ingenious. I got a tweet about that. And it I was ingenious. Know. Yeah. Have a listen. It's really okay. good. Quotes from uh, your f- wonderful um, bi- I- biography of Eddie Merckx. And, right. and they were segued into a bit of Larkin. I mean, difficult to tell them apart, to be Very honest. Very difficult. I mean, uh, difficult. two literary giants, obviously. Well, literary giants and a c- certain sensibility. Um, mm. L- Larkin's book on Eddie Merckx is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the third, the third <laughs> Merckx bi- biography. Anyway, um, we'll be returning to the Eddie Merckx biography, I think before the tour but we'll uh, do Eek. that at some point um, picking up some loose threads from the Dauphiné Tom de Moulin uh, went there having crashed out the Giro and he mentioned he didn't perform perhaps as he would have wished in the time trial that Wout van Aert won and the signs from de Moulin aren't that encouraging are they? No I didn't think so I thought he was a bit out of sorts um, just you know, spoke to him a few times and um he seemed a bit sheepish about the knee. The fact that he's still talking about it, um, well, the fact that he was still talking about it already was uh, was a little bit alarming. Then he pulled out and went back to Holland for supposedly more checks, more scans. And already, you know, the the Dutch journalists at the Dauphiné sensed that something fairly major was up, and that things were not had not gone according to plan. And um, because he was due back in the Alps a couple of days later for a training camp. And then, well, we've subsequently found out that um, he did have, he had another minor operation on the knee. And I think, was it yesterday or the day before, he was on his way back to the Alps and they turned and turned round, um, I think when he was two hours down the road, turned back having decided that no, he wasn't quite ready for, for this yet. Um, which is a, a bit worrying um, because the way it was put to us at the Dauphiné on Sunday was that at least um, at the training camp in the Alps he would be able to do exactly the exercises that his knee could definitely um, could definitely cope with at the moment rather than in a race basically being have, having to respond to race circumstances and almost being kind of bent out of shape. On the other hand, um, this operation to remove some shrapnel, some, some something from his knee which he obviously picked up at, at the Giro you know, if that resolves the problem that he's had because he's been getting pain in his knee, and that, that's clearly why If it, it sounds like a pretty minor procedure if that resolves the problem then, you know, he's still got a couple of weeks to get over that and be fit for the tour. The, the question may be the lack of racing and the lack of preparation and this might apply to Geraint Thomas as well. Well, yeah, I mean I looked at that earlier, Rich, just days of racing this year because it struck me, I mean I feel as though Thomas has not raced very much at all. Um, If he doesn't race again, um, so he crashed out of the Tour of Switzerland, he will have 24 days of racing by the time he lines up at the Tour de France. Um, I think perhaps even more worrying he'll only have 36 since last year's Tour de France Um, 12 of those were at the end of last year and I think he's only really competed in one race competed as in sort of race for a result and that was the Tour de Romandie where he came third Um, but Fulsang's 32 days of racing before the Tour um, will have or maybe 33 if he does the National Championships Dumoulin 27 Yates 35 I just looked at some from the last few years. So last year, Thomas was 29. Um, going back from there, Froome 26, Froome 26, Froome 27. Nibali in 2014, 42 races, Ooh. 42 days before the Tour de France. So Froome 30, Wiggins 30, Evans 28, Andy Schleck 37. So the kind of, the, the sort of ballpark figure has been around 30. Um, 24 is not very many. But Garen Thomas also he crashed out to and Adriatico. He had an altitude camp in Tenerife cut short because of, of snow. And these are the, the building blocks that you need. And you sensed, you know, that last year when Gary and Thomas won the tour, he did so because everything had gone right mm. and, and nothing had gone wrong. And somebody like Froome, who, you know, seemed apparently to have really turned himself around, he seems to be able to do that where other guys 
can't do it quite so so easily. And and by all accounts, I mean, we you know we heard that Thomas and Froome were were knocking lumps out of each other in Tenny from both going mm. very well recently. So, and you wonder, you know, what I said about the the Tour de France route, and it's also a fast start to this year's Tour de France. You know, in mountain stage, medium mountain stages in the Vosges very early, like um, before the end of the first week. Is that does that help or hinder someone who comes in without? who's maybe a little bit rusty, not, well, they'll be fresh, but maybe not quite race ready. I mean, on, on the one hand, you could say, well, obviously it, it's not, it doesn't help them. But then if the race sort of decants quickly and, and, you know, the general classification starts to take shape quite quickly, that could make it a bit less stressful. Um, you know, someone who's worried about crashing or who is vulnerable to crashes, someone, Thomas has been in, in the past, let's face it, you, you know, you'd be worried about, maybe eight days of flat stages which end in bunch sprints with Geraint Thomas um, just based on his on his past record so it might help him that um, that the GC battle kicks off very quickly I don't know yeah it could be hard though couldn't it the first stage going over the Moor and the Bosberg mm. I mean that even if they don't race it like the Tour of Flanders uh, it's still all about punch and positioning and a bit of luck and avoiding any uh, crashes and then a team time trial which is it's not not long or um, you know particularly daunting but it's in that's a really intense effort where uh, you know, somebody will get caught out and lose more than you'd ex- you'd expect, and the momentum will be set very early on. And and like you say, Daniel, you know, the Wednesday and Thursday, I think the La Planche de Belfi stage is on the Thursday, so there's not not no gentle introduction to the tour at all this year. And as you've already said really from the midway point in the race it is on every day there's something significant every single day um, all the way up to up to Paris so um, no no easing in I don't think and no kind of um, you know no downtime not significant downtime so it's looking incredibly open are we going to preview the Tour de France in the next two podcasts (laughs) we probably are that's how it works isn't it that is how it works everything leads to the tour now and I mean well you look at the Dauphiné and and, and, yeah it offers clues doesn't it it does offer clues, and sometimes those clues are a real kind of misdirection. I mean, Fuglesang is kind of the, the topic du jour now, isn't he? Um, TJ Van Garderen, probably the worst possible result for him finishing second because that ramps up expectations on him. Been fifth in the tour twice before, kind of the, the big American hope. There'll be a lot of expectation now on him. And, well, we've seen in the past, you know, the, one of the things he doesn't particularly seem to like is a lot of expectation on his shoulders and, and maybe he was already deflecting that when well he said to me on Sunday that Rigoberto Aran is their leader their strong, captain strong strong team because Mike, Mike, team, Mike yeah. Woods mm. was riding very well he had to pull out with illness as well didn't he yeah. Yeah. he was riding very well at the Dauphiné so they've got a very good sort of well balanced team of uh, Betiol as well going there and, and and just on the first week I always find it fascinating and this was also the case of the Giro just to see how different teams um, approach this question of the first week and you know, we talked to the Giro a lot about how Mitchelton tend to surround their leader with rulers in, in a similar way to BMC did when Cadell Evans won the Tour de France and then on the other hand you have a team like Astana who well that's not their forte and never has been and they will look to race completely differently and what you know one of those approaches obviously will prove to be the right approach with with this year's first week first 10 days being the way they are and what about Wout van Aert then um won two stages a time trial and a sprint and has looked good all season and is going to the Tour de France for the first time with Jumbo Visma um and Primoz Roglic is not going to the Tour de France, having initially, we think, been planning to do um, the Giro and the Tour. Obviously, his Giro unravelled, having looked so good. At, so good that Richard crowned him the winner after about nine day or one. ten days. No, it's day one. Day one. And I then, said he'd won then again, after nine or ten days, you couldn't <laughs> see him being beaten. Um, but he unravelled pretty spectacularly, didn't he? Oh, he finished third. Yeah, but it was uh, oh, it was it was tumbling downhill though, wasn't mm. it? Oh. Do you not think? I think uh, I think he's he's being judged by some of the expectations going into the race rather than the actual result. Well, judged by the the first ten days, surely. I mean, he looked looked. Yeah, I mean, 
S Simon Yates tumbled down the classification last year. I, d I think Roglic finishing on the podium was not not a bad result, but but we could see that his form was dipping, mm. and so I think we said that we'd be surprised if he if he rode the tour given that and given the season he's he's had. So Wout van Aert, though, I mean, dream scenario is that he could be a credible challenger to Peter Sagan in the race for the green jersey, be, no? Be careful what you say about Wout van Aert because a couple of the Belgian colleagues, our Belgian colleagues at the Dauphine, Dauphine were telling me that he reads absolutely everything that's written about him. The and often, oh, I don't know, um, often um, will comment to the journalists, um, the offending journalists really? the following day. Yeah, no, it, that's fine. Wow. <laughs> Keeps you on your toes. So, so can he challenge Peter to go for the green jersey then, Daniel? Uh, I mean, um, he's got, he's that, no, he shouldn't be able to. He really shouldn't be able to because he will have his hands full. He'll have his hands full trying to complete well more than eight consecutive ra days of racing for the first time in in his life. Mm, yeah. um, he'll have his hands full in Dylan Grunewagen's lead out train and. Um, Presumably, he'll also be expected to, well, on those days that we mentioned in the Vosges, which is already the first week, um, he'll have to do something there for Stephen Kreiswijk. So that's a no. That's a sorry, no. sorry, wow, if you're listening. <laughs> um, before we wrap things up, can we just can I mention Remco Evenepoel's uh, victory in the yeah, Tour Belgium? Yeah, I think that would be absolutely spot on. <laughs> How long before Remco it becomes a, just, a single yeah. name, just a Rem, just Remco I think in the right. vein of yeah. Shaq and but, but and mm, Michael and nineteen years Pavel. old, you know, <laughs> nineteen years old, uh, you know, quite quite a controversial I think Jonathan Vauter said that he had uh, texted Patrick Lefebvre to sort of dress him down for signing an 18 year old and, and putting and, and, and putting him under that sort of pressure of riding the world tour already and he's not had the easiest of years but he's shown in flashes you know the, the talent that he's clearly got but I think we all wondered whether that just not winning as frequently as he did before turning professional might just wear him down a bit and I think at the Tour of Belgium I think if he goes on to become you know, a great champion, we'll probably look back on this Tour of Belgium in his first year in the same way that we look back on you know, Greg LeMond's early results or something as being a sign of the talent. And the way... Well, we, we saw Adam Blythe last night, who's a lot, who was riding that race. Didn't see, didn't see a lot of Remco Evan and Paul, he said, but he was riding that race and his teammate Victor Campenarts was second. Now, Victor Campenarts, you know, maybe not the best road racing cyclist in the world, but the world are a record holder, very strong time trialist. And Evanipol just rode him off his wheel a couple of times. Not just Campenarts, but Tim Wellens as well, um, who's a you know very, very accomplished rider and a strong rider. And it was a really impressive display at the Tour of Belgium. Stage win was, was kind of reminiscent of his world championship win last year he, he just seems to be able to ride people off his wheel Adam Blythe gave us a load of figures about the watts he, that Campenarts was putting out just in, to try and keep up with him and they sounded although, high watts they sounded high they sounded like a me. lot of watts yeah. and uh, the guy's clearly got a, a huge talent a huge engine and it is just a case for that team um, De Kuhn and Quickstep of you know trying to manage that and trying to let release it at certain points while not you know, just keeping the pressure off him a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think criticising Lefebvre for signing someone who clearly is a big talent because he's a teenager, I, I think that's a bit strange. Uh, I think the key is how they do manage him. Well, you can mention and that when you have lunch with Jonathan Vosters uh, quite well, soon. Well, maybe I will, yeah. Um, uh, I, the the key is, 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 you know, kind of a quick, quick, slow approach, you know, expose him to something. I mean, let's let's not forget the, the Belgium Tour, it, it's not a world tour race. I mean, it's a big deal in Belgium and uh, that will uh, certainly have caught the eye of the of the media there, uh, of Enipol winning, but it's not, uh, you know, no, it it's not like, it's no, not it like wasn't a super over, over exposing him to racing. And let's not overlook the fact that if, uh, De Kerning Quickstep hadn't signed him somebody else would have done and so that's how sport works and, and there's no um, there's no 
benefit in the, even the short term to, to um, flogging him uh, uh, while he's still a teenager. They, they've got to be gentle with him. I think where Lefebvre deserves some criticism is the comments in the press about Evenepoel's weight and, um, you know, the, the, the fact that he was too, it's too heavy for the sort of super skinny world of the World Tour. Uh, perhaps be a little bit more gentle on, on that sense. No, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'll give him some time. Daniel. Yeah, but you, I think, as I say, you, oh, I don't know. I think part of the job. I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it is. It's not. Yeah, it is. But yeah, I guess it's part of it's the just part. It's just, it's in a way, it's the same as you know expecting results from him, isn't it? It's, it's pressure, and and maybe at that at that age and um, stage in his development, he shouldn't be put under the pressure to perform and, and win races or to be as skinny as he'll probably need to be when he's a bit later on. Maybe it's. But what do we know? We're not managing anybody we can barely manage ourselves <laughs> um i was going to mention something else there um just quickly on that team to kind of quick step uh we're speaking a day after um elia viviani won uh, having obviously been very disappointed at the giro not not to win and it was really noticeable how effective eve lampar and michael morkov in particular uh, were for Viviani and you you look at I mean obviously Viviani will go to the Tour de France with with those two guys to help him there um, and uh, you, you wonder if if Morkov in particular had been at the Giro as he was last year maybe Viviani would have won a couple of stages there because he's so he's such a good lead out man not only did he lead him out perfectly he then just drifted ever so slightly to the right to impede Peter Sagan a, a little bit without breaking any rules or you know it was it, he just created a little bit more space for Sagan to come around and help Viviani you're going to be the best sprinter at the tour well that that's what I wondered I watching think, that mm, or the atomic tadpole well the atomic tadpole Grona Vegan did you did you, this completely passed me by I don't know how but uh, are you um, familiar with these rumours that Marcel Kittel is going to sign for Jumbo Visma oh yeah I heard, heard that um, when I thought about it I thought there is a team out there who really do need a, a fast sprinter, um, and maybe you should go there. But then I remember the team was Katusha. Yeah, Hardison. I was about to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't really probably work. But yeah, that was a rumor, wasn't it? What would that? I mean, what would that be for? To ride something resembling a B program. Interesting. Yeah, that was what I heard at the Dauphiné, but it's it's a rumor at this stage. Well. Should we, before we go actually, um, I should mention that we, having sold out of limited edition mugs uh, made by Stacey Snyder at the Giro, she's producing more mugs for the Tour de France and all money raised but from sales of the mugs will go to a good cause or good causes. Please send a nomination and if you nominate a good cause for the Giro and we didn't pick you, Apologies, because we've got some great nominations. Just nominate again. Don't be put off. Don't think that because your um, nomination wasn't accepted the first time around, it won't be this time around. Um, we, 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 there were a couple that we we're really, you know, close to picking last time around. So please do send again. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com and raised over two thousand dollars for good causes. It was the Kelly Catlin Fund and Ride for Charlie. And that money has been paid to those respective good causes now. So um, please do nominate a good cause. Before the Tour de France comes out, I think we've got a, a very special special uh, coming subject to it happening next week. Oh, I don't want to sort of give anything away here. But on. I, mean, I'm, I mean, just don't start having a go at me about my weight. That would be just too much pressure <laughs> for me as a young Never. rider. Never. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we're hoping that we're going to be able to release a special um, that will be hopefully quite good uh, before the Tour de France. And you can get that if you sign up as a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Have we any other business chaps this week? I think so. Part two of the Tour de France preview next week. And then part three the following week. I think that's a press conference, isn't it? Are we doing before oh, the yeah, Tour? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Press conference. Um, get your questions in for the Tour de France pre-race press conference. We'll answer as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, the number. The number is plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. That's plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. Leave a a voice memo on WhatsApp and uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can in a couple of weeks. But until next week, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps.
You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. 